All right, all right. What's up, guys? Everybody is on. <clears throat> Let's see. Nobody wants to show their face. Totally cool. It's just me then today that is on camera. Maybe you guys are busy. There's Tony. I see a friendly face. Uh, there's another one. Andrew Peters is here. Thank you guys for showing your faces, making yourselves known today. Hey, look, I know it is a busy time of year. There's Jerry. We've got another face in the crowd. Uh, good to see you guys. Is that an alarm? Do you guys hear an alarm going on? Sorry. You guys hear that? Yes? No? Don't hear it? Okay. It's just an alarm going off in my head. It's good to see you guys today. Um, welcome to the virtual roundtable call. I am your host. Kylie is not here today. Josh is not here today. And I understand there's a lot going on. I am glad that you guys are here today. And I'm not just by myself on this call. I'm excited about today's conversation. Jerry, you were the first one logged on today. So I'm going to ask you if you don't mind opening us up in a word of prayer. Excited about today's conversation from Brian Sams. I'm going to spotlight you. If you could just open us up in a word of prayer uh, that our time today would be profitable. Thank you guys for being here. All right, let's pray. Lord, we just uh, thank you for um, another opportunity, Lord, just to be here and to gather as men that you've chosen to uh, lead your churches, to shepherd your churches, Lord, and and to be a part of the ministries at our local churches, Lord. I just pray that you would be with um, Brian Sams this morning, Lord, and uh, allow him to just to speak into our lives, Lord, on this subject, Lord, allow us to be attentive to uh, the things that he will share and, and find those ways that we can adjust and, and to add to the ministries that you've called us to to be in. Lord, thank you for each individual that's here, Lord. I pray that you would be with those that are out, that are out traveling, that couldn't be in this group this morning. Lord, I just ask that you would um, bring them back uh, safely next week. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thanks, Jerry. Appreciate that. Uh, good to see you guys. Good to see you on another Tuesday. We still got guys coming into the room. I don't know if May is busy for you guys or not. May is pretty busy for our ministry here. I'm sure that it is for many of yours too. I remember last year we were on a call right around June or July, and I was just swamped. I had so much going on in the summer. Um, we tried to do a couple missions trips. There's youth camps. There's BBS. It feels to me like summer is a very busy time for our ministry and there were other guys on here talking in one of the one of the breakout rooms or maybe even in the main room. And they were like, you know, summer's really chill for us. We don't you know, we have a lot of people on vacation. We don't do a whole lot. And I'm thinking, man, summer is no chill for me. Um, but anyway, I don't know what ministry's like in this season for you. Hopefully it's getting nicer and a little bit warmer wherever you are in your part of the country or in your part of the world. We've got guys logged on here today. Uh, we've got others that are not logged on that are going to watch on replay, uh, but we want to welcome all of you to being here with us today. As you can see, Kylie is not here today. Josh is not here today. And if you've looked through to see who's here, you will also notice that Brian Sams is also not here today. And I'll explain a little bit more of that. Uh, I'm flying solo today on Sunday night. <clears throat> excuse me. I got a text from Brian Sams on Sunday night. And he said, hey, man, I hate to do this. And I don't know about you, pastors, but I hate to get a text like that. I hate to get a text from someone I'm counting on and depending on that starts out with, I hate to do this to you, but. And so Brian said, I've had something come up in my church. He didn't elaborate as to what that was. He said, but long story short, I am not going to be available to do that talk at that time slot on Tuesday. And I said, OK, well. Um, let me think. <clears throat> and then he offered to send a video of the talk that he was going to do, which was a better idea than one that I could come up with. So Brian actually sent me a video yesterday. Um, this is, I think, a 20 to 21 minute talk on the topic that he had planned. So I, with good conscience, still threw out the link this morning, <clears throat> still let you know that Brian was going to be doing a talk, 10 tips that will have a positive impact on your preaching. So what we're going to do today is have a little bit of grace with me. I've never shared screen and shown a video before. I hope that you're able to hear. But when I start playing it, just give me a thumbs up if you can see Brian and hear Brian. He's obviously not live. And then when his video is done, we will stick around and do some discussion on the topics. Okay, so that's what we're going to do today. We're going to go live 
right now to him in his recorded video. I'm going to share screen. Let me see here. <clears throat> Hey friends, it's uh, Brian Sams here from River City Baptist Church, Jacksonville, Florida. I want to first of all just say uh, that I'm sorry uh, that I could not be there live today. I, as many of you would know, sometimes uh, in your church things just come up and I had a last minute unavoidable conflict. And so I want to apologize to Jason uh, and to Josh and to all of you for not being in person with you. And I always enjoy these um, coaching times, these roundtable discussions. And so uh, I know I've benefited from them myself. And so, but what I uh, decided to do to make up for my uh, my failures was to go ahead and give you some content on the topic that I wanted to speak on. And so uh, I'm going to do this and then you guys are going to break out into your discussions and hope it's helpful. Of course, if you ever need anything, uh, you ever have any questions, you can reach out to me. Uh, Jason and Josh, those guys can feel free to pass on my email or my cell phone even, and I, I would love to be a help to you if I can. Uh, hey, so here's what I want to talk about. I got just just a few minutes to do this, and I'm going to do a quick brush by. I'm going to speak to you for a few minutes on 10 ways, 10 tips that will have an immediate positive impact on your preaching. 10 tips that will have an immediate positive impact on your preaching. Now, let me give you just a quick background brush. I, I don't claim to be a preaching expert by any means. Um, one guy online recently uh, nailed me and said, uh, you know, you're not as good of a preacher as you think you are. And I, and I said, well, you're probably certainly right about that. I don't think I'm a great preacher at all. Uh, but I, I have had the opportunity over the last 15 years to teach a uh, homiletic. Yeah, no worries. No worries. Yeah. yeah, and I've had the opportunity to evaluate well over 3,000 sermons from college students. And it's interesting that I have just seen um, things repeated over time that I've been asked or that have come up. And the truth is, um, I share a lot of these things with a lot of people that I've had a privilege of coaching them in preaching, particularly college students, and even some pastors. I will say that I'm excited this fall to be releasing uh, this content in a full form. I'm actually going to be releasing a book in November. The title of the book is going to be The Whetstone, and it's 100 Strategies to Sharpen Your Sermons. And I'll be giving a lot more content about that this summer. And so today is a little bit of a sneak peek into some of the things that I'll be talking about. So when I want to try to help somebody with preaching and teaching, there's so many things. In fact, my 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 research in my book will be uh, the 100 tips stretched out over 10 categories. So 10 big categories of preaching, and then within those 10 categories, 10 tips for each category. And so, but if I were starting from the very beginning with someone and just saying, hey, look, these are the, this is foundational. These are some things that you need to put in as foundational to improve your preaching I would go all the way back and I would start with preaching in the sense of preparing to preach. And so these 10 tips that I'm going to give you today are mostly about preparing to preach. You know, if I were to ask you what is more important, preparation or delivery, I would sure hope that you would say preparation. And there's a lot of reasons for that. But one of the most obvious reasons is it doesn't matter how well you can communicate. It doesn't matter how good of a preacher you are. If you do not have good content and you're not well prepared, um, it's going to be a difficult thing for you uh, to, to be an effective preacher just on that one particular account. So being prepared to preach, sermon prep, if you will, uh, is no doubt the most vital thing about preaching. So I'm going to give you 10 things. Uh, I'm sending these notes to Jason as well. And so hopefully you'll have maybe a handout or at least something you can take away from with uh, from this lesson with, because I'm going to kind of have to go through them pretty quickly here. So here are 10 tips about sermon prep that can have an immediate positive impact on your preaching. Number one, commit to sequential exposition. 
Now, expository preaching is a huge subject, simply, as most of you probably know, just means to draw out of the text its intended meaning, to expose. Ex in Greek means out of. Uh, it means to draw out of the passage. The opposite would be eisegesis, reading into the passage. So I would I would assume that many of you uh, believe uh, in expository preaching at least at some level. With rare exception, the best thing I think that you can do for a church, even for yourself for that matter, is to preach through the Bible in sequence. That's why I said sequential exposition. Now, there's no right or wrong way to do this. I'm just simply telling you, I think it can be a real advantage to your preaching. Um, there is a, an advantage really for you. The preacher avoids the stress of trying to determine what to preach. Uh, like me, for example, I'm in a very busy season of life right now, as I know all of you are. I'm raising young kids. I'm pastoring a growing church. I teach college ca uh, uh, classes. I operate a, a ministry called Church Advance. It has a conference and coaching and all sorts of other applications. And I'm busy. And I know you're busy. One thing that keeps me grounded is the consistent and sequential teaching of the Bible, literally knowing every passage and the thrust of every message for the coming year is a peace and relief to me. When I say sequential, I'm saying preaching through books of the Bible, passages of the Bible in sequence. So I might preach one chapter one week and one the next week or a paragraph one week and the next one the next week. And there's a way for you to plan that out over the course of time, that when you wake up on Monday, you're not trying to decide what to preach. You can go ahead and begin your research for the sermon that is coming up. So when I say sequential, that's what I mean. So that's the first tip. Commit yourself to sequential exposition. Number two, consider sermon preparation your most important task. Obviously, pastoral work is complex. It's just not that simple. I understand that, and I know you do as well. The words pastor and elder and bishop explain the responsibility of church leadership, feeding the flock of God, administrating the church, providing an example of the believer, as well as a host of other things. I know for me, it's easy to gravitate toward responsibilities that allow me to check things off of a list. Administrative work can be rewarding when it's completed. Then, of course, there's the tyranny of the urgent. There's so many things coming at us. So many days look different than other days. Um, there are times where you just have to drop everything and do it. So what do you have to do to compensate for all that? You have to consider sermon preparation your most important work. And I believe that that's the distinguishing factor of the pastor. He's the shepherd. He's the teacher. And so preparing food to feed sheep is your chief responsibility. And if you don't believe that, then it's going to get pushed aside and, it, and you're not going to be able to give the kind of effort that you should or must give to it. So number two, consider sermon prep your most important task. Number three, the third tip that can have an immediate impact on your teaching is this, prepare ahead, prepare ahead. Planned expositional preaching alleviates the log jam that is oftentimes created by unpredictable ministry schedules. So um, think about going into a Thursday or Friday and all these things are still yet to be done. Something's not going to get done. Okay, the log jam is going to hit. So when I wake up on Monday morning, I start right into the task. And Monday morning and Tuesday morning are particularly the most important foundational times for me to start working on my sermon for the week. So prepare ahead. By preparing ahead, I know where I'm going. And then in my individual week, I'm ahead, which leads me to the fourth thing. Number four, get an early start. Get an early start. Mondays and Tuesdays are critical. I'll tell you what, I just literally ended a meeting this afternoon with one of our interns and he was asking me about preaching and application and interpretation. And I said to him, I said, Levi, here's the key, man, to being able to be effective in application is being so solid in your interpretation early in the week, your research, your study. At some point, you're able to flip and turn your sermon prep into the creative side. This is where 
application comes into play. And if you haven't done the interpretive work early in the week, you're going to have pro problems with some of the creative work later in the week. And so if you get an early start, that way, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, uh, you are really in the creative space. You're thinking about application. You're gathering illustrations. All the hard work has been done. Now you can set back and be creative. And it's the difference between good and great preaching. I think it's the difference between shallow and deep preaching. And I'm not, I'm not talking about deep, like being boring or academic. I'm talking about going deep in application so that the people will really have something specific and solid to take home with them when you teach. That was number four, get an early start. Number five. Saturation is the key. And what I mean by that is make sure your sponge is full. You need to saturate your life into three things when you're preaching. First, you saturate yourself into the text. Number two, you saturate yourself into its research. And then number three, you saturate yourself into your sermon. By saturation, I'm talking about focusing on the reading of the text, on the ingestion of good research material, and then in the process of um, thinking deeply through uh, imagining, visualizing, internalizing your material. So think of it those three ways again. You're going you're gonna to saturate yourself in the text. That's the first job. Read, 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 read. You're going to saturate yourself in the research. And then you're going to saturate yourself once your manuscript or your sermon is complete. Then you're going to saturate yourself in the message by internalizing it so that you can deliver with greater freedom. Okay, so let me review real quick. Number one, commit to sequential exposition. Number two, consider sermon prep your most important work. Number three, prepare ahead. Number four, get an early start. Number five, saturation is the key. Number six, Block off sections of deep work. Block off sections of deep work. Now, I think if you have an effective calendar, it probably is broken up into blocks. You need to be able to block yourself out to be able to do deep thinking work. Uh, a, lot of, a lot of personal development people or personal management people talk about deep work. You must plan sections of time my schedule is broken up into morning, afternoon, and evening. Morning, afternoon, and evening. For me, my most creative and, and best use of my time for sermon prep is morning. That's when I'm fresh. That's when I think the clearest. That's when I can be creative. That's when I study the best. In the afternoon, like right now is an afternoon, I do meetings with people. I do recordings of content that I've already prepared like this. I will answer emails, phone calls. Uh, usually when somebody calls for a meeting with me or they say, Pastor, can we talk or can I call you? I'm typically going to say, sure, how about one o'clock or how about two o'clock? I just know when I need to block off and protect deep work sections and do not sacrifice that for anything. Go somewhere where you won't be reached. Find an off the grid coffee shop or restaurant. Use noise canceling earbuds and focus on your task. Give yourself, I think, at least one three-hour uninterrupted block for sermon prep every week, and I think you'll find it to have a transforming effect on the output of your sermons. I love getting the messages back from guys that I talked to. One guy took a picture of his laptop and his his earbuds, and he said, hey, I'm, I'm, I'm at the coffee shop for the first time in my life studying. It eliminates people stopping by. It eliminates uh, people calling your church phone it eliminates uh you know the 70 year old dude that's always at your church always wanting to hang around it just gets you out of that space and allows you to focus if you allow your phone to notify you all the time every time you get a distraction or notification you can get off task for up to 20 minutes so like that's why on my apple watch i don't have notifications ever on my apple watch i don't need another thing telling me i've got a phone call or an email or a text message. Uh, I, I I use the do not disturb feature frequently on my phone, particularly during those times. It's so important to block off sections of deep work. Now, number seven, number seven, have an incubation period. I recommend 
a 48 hour window between the completion of your sermon and the delivery of your sermon. 48 hour window. Now, I did an entire session on just this at Idea Summit uh, 2023 there in Dallas. And uh, I know that it was a great session that, that was received well by many people. But I talk about this idea of internalization, incubation, marination, whatever you want to call it. But you have to have space between your sermon being done so that you can do things like internalize, editorialize, criticize, memorize, really think through the process, really think through the sermon, really give yourself the space. And which leads me really to the next thing. And again, I'm going to run out of time here, but the next thing, which is number eight, do not preach a rough draft. Okay, I'm a teacher, guys. I teach in college. I've been teaching for years. I can read a research paper and within five minutes know if this is the student's best work or if they threw it together. Um, I can look at the formatting. I can look at the bibliography page. I can look at the footnotes. I can look at one paragraph spelling and grammar and know very quickly this is a rough draft. Okay, one thing is for sure, a seasoned teacher can always tell the difference between a rough draft and a final draft. All research papers should minimally go through a rough draft, an edited draft, and then a final draft. If you turn in a rough draft, your mistakes are going to be evident. Same thing is true with a sermon. If you preach what we call the quote unquote Saturday night special, you threw it together, you were cutting, pasting, and grabbing illustrations from, you know, Ministry 127 or illustration.com or whatever. You don't have time for meditation, for incubation, for the thought, prayer, and the Spirit's guidance to improve and edit the sermon and bring it into its best form. You must criticize your sermon. You must editorialize your sermon, and you must in large part, memorize your sermon. I'm not talking about memorizing for performance. I'm talking about internalizing the message in such a way that you can deliver freely uh, without the need for notes. You may have them, but you shouldn't need them. And everybody can tell the difference between a sermon that is on paper and a sermon that is in your heart. Uh, so that's number eight. Do not preach a rough draft. Do not do the Saturday night special. Give yourself time and space to uh, fix the sermon and edit it. Number nine, okay, be resource ready. Be resource ready. What I mean by that is the beginning of a series or even the preparation of an individual sermon can be most challenging. One of the ways that you can jump off of the starting block better is if you have resources ready to go before you start, okay? What I'm talking about here is knowing your tools and knowing where you're going. There are many helpful types of tools, but there are two essential tools, okay? Let me give you the two essential tools everybody needs for preaching. Um, this is like a screwdriver and a hammer, okay? What do you need? You need um, reference tools and homiletical commentaries. Okay, what do I mean by that? Reference tools are things like dictionaries, lexical tools, historical backgrounds, encyclopedias, okay, that is, those are indispensable. Now, I use Logos now, and uh, it has much of that in it, and so if you don't, uh, find a way, buy the sets of books, whatever you need to do. Much of it is available on stuff like blueletterbible.com or other, blueletterbible.org and other free resources, but uh, again, I would highly recommend using Logos or some other tool like that that synchronizes these kinds of resources, but reference type works. You need to know those things. Number two, homiletical commentaries, meaning commentaries that are designed with exegetical work and the preaching moment in focus. Let me give you a really good example. I'm not going to, I don't have much more time, but Crossway's preaching the word commentary in Wearsby's B-series or Bible exposition, those would be two examples of homiletical commentaries that really, really, really help you out significantly. Some commentaries are just not useful. Devotional commentaries are not good for interpretation. Technical commentaries are over most people's heads. That's why I say homiletical commentaries are very good. Now, finally, number 10, you want to improve your preaching. Let me encourage you, avoid man's influence, okay? 
Avoid man's influence. What do I mean? A big mistake preachers can make is to immediately jump into commentaries, other people's sermons, or articles to begin gathering material for their sermons. You may even be tempted to use curriculum or other prepackaged sermons that people sell. I recently saw an Advent series for sale, or, a, or even more recently, an Easter series. Here was the promotion for the Advent series. With the business of Christmas, let us take one thing off your to-do list, and that one thing, of course, was preparing your sermons. That is terrible, okay? It's terrible promotion. Actually, it's great promotion, but it's it will be a terrible path for any preacher to walk down. It sounds great if you're talking about the convenience of online shopping or a gift card, but it's a terrible idea when it comes to sermon prep. God's people need to hear, thus saith the Lord, not thus saith Dr. Whoever. Well, guys, look, I, I, I've i extended my time even 30 seconds longer than I needed. Obviously, I could say so much more. If I could help you in any way, let me know. Jason has a set of notes to give you, talking points, I guess, to go through. But man, I sure love the Idea Network, and I love you guys, and I hope the best for you. And here's to better days of preaching ahead. God bless you guys. All right, we are back. Uh, that was that was good quality. It was a little choppy there at the very beginning, so sorry about that. But it it caught up. Uh, as he said, I do have the notes. Let me work on a good way to send those over to you. But I do, I do have them. Obviously, we're not able to do a Q and A today. We would normally be able to do that with Brian. Um, I actually purchased that Advent series. Um, no, I'm kidding. I didn't. I was going to see if any of you guys did. Uh, here's what I'd like to do with the discussion today. I've got a few questions that I wrote down just from his talk. But I want to swap over to gallery view. Uh, yeah, there we go. And any comments that you guys have that you would like to share uh, based on Brian's talk, I'm just going to open the floor. We've got about 14 of us in here live right now. So feel free to unmute yourself, give some feedback on that. And uh, whoever wants to go first can. And I'm going to figure out how to send you guys his transcript, his notes from today. Anyone want to start us off? All right, I'm going to start with a question. What was the most helpful tip to you that Brian gave? Obviously, I'm excited about his book coming out. I had not heard that uh, until he said it at the very beginning. So I'm excited to see what all those 100 tips are. But of the 10 he gave today, what was the most helpful tip to you personally? Anyone want to start there? Yeah, go ahead, Tony. Let's see if we can get you unmuted here. Andrew, oh, sorry. Unmute. Go ahead, Tony. Uh, the, uh, the idea of letting it marinate that last 48 hours uh, I try to do that and I can feel the difference of when I don't do that because then you're able to preach the message over and over in your mind and that helps you get away from your notes. The more that you have it on your heart and your mind, the more you share it that way and you're not tied to your notes to try to figure out what you're saying next. So I, I, I try to do that, but hearing him say that really kind of uh, solidified that. So I thought that was great. Yeah. Yeah. Great point. Andrew Peters, I saw you uh, had something to say. Go ahead. Yeah, mine was the same. So out of all 10 of those, I think the same thing that was the most helpful was the, the incubation period. I, I'm one of the world's worst of it, it's not Saturday night, um, you know, last minute. It's more of an intentional doing something that Saturday night. But um, having that incubation period, I think it's something I've got to get built into my, my prep time. Solid. It is interesting. You guys chose the same one. AJ, go ahead. Uh, uh, yeah, I, I I thought the uh, the three hours, you know, just uh, getting away, getting getting out of a uh, into a place that you know you know you're not going to be distracted. That one really stuck out to me really well there as well. Uh, I you know getting you know 
being in the office is one thing and working on a sermon, but going somewhere where you know there's not going to be any, you know, distractions or someone just pop into the office and, and do that. That's that was a really good one. Yeah. Yeah, that was good. I actually did that today. I don't have the 70 year old that hangs out around the church like he cited, but uh, I know some of you do. Some of us do have that guy or that person that's hanging around. So that totally makes sense. Uh, what else? What else was helpful to you? What was the most helpful hint that spoke out? Yeah, I had one, uh, I think similar to everyone else, the one that stuck out was just having that 48 hour window, but uh, also one, the avoid man's influence, not purchasing sermons, but it tends to go to a conference or go to something, uh, even at teen camp or something like that, hear a message and go, I want to preach that message too. And uh, sometimes you know, when it comes to sermon prep or anything like that, it's, it's relating to that one message I heard. I thought, man, I really want to preach that as well, instead of letting God work through the study and through the message and everything that's going on. You guys preach amazing messages. I hear some of you. So, uh, you know, sometimes I'm like, man, I want to preach that message. That's a good message. I like the way they said it. Yeah. Yeah, that was good. We had a great talk last week about AI and how that a lot of us are going to get caught by doing that. <laughs> So that's uh that's a good uh it's a good thought. All those guys that bought that advent series, it, they'll be out. It'll be out that that's what they did for sure. Uh those are good. What uh what other uh most helpful tips stuck out to you guys? Jason, I was going to uh, agree with Jerry on the avoid man's influence. Um not only not only in purchasing sermons and series and things like that, but um I I know the the circles that I was in growing up and, and all of that so many times one preacher would say something and, and then you begin to hear it echoed and echoed and echoed and there's no biblical basis for a lot of it but but it becomes it becomes our doctrine because somebody that is recognized and speaks at a big conference they said it and so it must be bible because our pastor said amen you know and uh and and it's so it's so sad when we begin to to begin to read that doctrine into the Bible when when we're reading and studying and everything without doing any research to check it out. And we're we're guilty of it, you know, but uh, but we've we've been influenced by man. So that that's so important. Really good thoughts there, Philip. Really solid. What else? Anyone else want to jump in on that? Hey Jason. This yeah. is James Kephart. Hey, I got a question. Um, and maybe some of you guys can just share what you do, but I think one of the things I struggle with that he talked about is planning your messages well in advance. And I'm like, for example, I'm preaching through the gospel of John. And I mean, that seems easy to, to plan that out, but, um, like this, for example, this last Sunday, I was planning on preaching uh, chapter 10 verses 22 through 42, the end of the chapter. And it just became so much that I had to basically put into two sermons. And so you make that schedule and then it just keeps getting pushed out. And um, I'm just curious how you guys go about in making those preaching schedules on, on laying out the, the text and, you know, what is your practice in doing so? Really great question, James. Who wants to weigh in on that? Dennis. Yeah, go ahead, Dennis. You've been volunteered. Um, James, say that question again. You caught him. He wasn't listening. You <laughs> him. He, he was texting on his phone. No, but my que I guess my question is, what is your guys' practice for oh, yeah. no, laying out your messages? Yeah. I got it. So, um, okay. So uh, on the Idea Network, we have the sessions every now and then on scheduling like your personal time in a year. Um, for me, I was challenged, uh, of course, been pastoring now 12 years. It was year number, uh, really, it was year number one. And Josh Tyson, Josh Ermler, it was kind of, we launched, you know, we launched Idea Network in 2013. We started our church in 2012, 2011. And we were sitting down at a restaurant one time just talking about prep. And one thing that they had encouraged me with was, and I still use a similar thing now, I actually schedule my year out. Um, I do mine every August and September for the following year. Um, I always have a running, so I'm just going to get throw out some thoughts. I always have a running note of books I want to preach through 
or if I'm going to preach a standalone message on a topic that I feel would be instrumental for our church or a series, I keep a running tab on that, a running note on that. And then when it comes to August, September, I plan out like where I'm going to be for every message for the entire year. I don't necessarily plan out like here's the specific three or four points that I'm going to do. And here's the illustration I'm going to use. I just, here's the direction. So like for me right now, I'm preaching through, we just finished a series called Hope in Darkness. That was just the first three chapters of the book of Luke. I'm taking a standalone week for Mother's Day. Then I'll be three weeks in um, a spiritual gift series out of 1 Corinthians uh, 10, 11, 12, 13. And then I'll jump back into the book of Luke in a new series um, called Encountering Christ. And so it's, it's still an expositional study, but it's something I mapped out last year. And we're actually only going to Luke chapter nine, and then I'll take a break and I'll jump back in that series in 2024 for a new series from Luke 10 to Luke 24. Um, so the, the challenge that was given to me by Josh Ermler and Josh Tice years ago, when we were talking through it was just scheduling it and then giving some grace periods. So I build into every series two or three weeks that uh, maybe I can fluctuate or I'm going to get asked to preach somewhere or I'm going to be sick or something like that. Um, I try to build all of that in to, to my schedule. It's helped me. And then building the, um, uh, building the breathing period has helped me too, because then I'm not, I'm not bound to, you know, well, I have to preach. Luke chapter four, verses one through 10 this week. No, I can combine it with week number two and take a break and just focus on something, something else. I don't know if that helps, James. That's awesome. Hey, really good thoughts there. Um, I, I've noticed Tice doing that too, where he will preach through like a gospel and it's like a big, broad series, but he'll chop it up into little mini series. I've noticed how he'll he'll do that a lot of times because our attention span, people are into like four to six week, eight week maybe series. And when you when you're preaching through Matthew, you're not going to get that in eight weeks, more than likely. And so I really like that model. Who else wants to jump in on James question? That's a really good one. I'd be curious to know others of you. Uh, I'm going to I'm going to throw Philip under the bus since he just threw Dennis under the bus. Philip, just get ready to answer. OK, what do you what do you what do you guys do? I I was challenged to take some time away, like uh, like um, Brian was saying, the the three hours a week or so. Um, I don't I don't get three hours a week, but every once in a while I'll I'll t I'll take a day and go and and uh, just uh, pray and plan, study whatever whatever the Lord um, has on my heart for that day. And a while back, I I went through and and uh, just kind of work through the book that I, I'm, I'm preaching through Genesis right now. And I just, I just worked through and, and laid it all out. And I, Genesis, I've got a year's worth right there. Um, and, uh, and included in there, you know, just uh, different things that uh, like different uh, times I'll be preaching away or somebody's going to be preaching for us, special services, this and that. And, uh, and I, I just look through there, pray through it and, and, get generally the topic uh laid out for each week and uh and then like Dennis was saying give some flexibility in there for uh for the lord to uh to change the direction or the the emphasis or whatever for that um for that particular service right on who else wants to jump in on that yeah AJ I see you uh I, I know something my brother does and I don't know if this is really the question or not but uh uh, he does very similar to what Dennis does and plans his year out, but uh, he he takes a whole week actually uh, in the in the fall there, kind of like uh, like you were saying, and uh, he takes a whole week. He 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 actually has used it to go and visit some of the major cities in the U.S. You know, he kind of makes it a trip, but he yeah. also you know he prays through and plans out his whole year of of, of preaching those types of things. Uh, he he's he's pretty good at that, but. Uh, he also, uh, you know, fits in like Dennis was saying with those those times where he's gonna, he knows he's gonna have a guest speaker in, or he's gonna have a, uh, uh, you know, an opportunity for uh, for somebody else to step up in the pulpit, that that type of thing as well. But and and right along with what Philip was saying, he he also I, I like how he kind of he takes a whole section of uh, you know the Bible and then he'll actually break those up into smaller chunks, that kind of thing as 
as well. But I, I like the thought of just getting away, getting, you know, kind of taking that time to really look at your year. What is that going to look like and pray through it through that week, uh, you know, for the for your year's messages, that type of thing. And so I know that's uh, I, I'm an associate guy. He's a lead guy. And so that that's just something that I know that he shared with me that he took that, you know, that a week of time to be able to do that. I don't know if that's really what James is asking. How do you plan that out for a year or how do you just plan it out for, you know, a single series or whatnot? Yeah. So just by a show of hands, how many of you that preach every week, you plan it out 52 a year, you plan it out about a year or so in advance. Anyone do it specifically that way? You've got the next 50 or so. Dennis does that. Philip does that. Um, Sam's obviously does that. Okay. Um, cool. Hey, did that, did that PDF come through on the chat? Are you able to, okay. You got those. All right. Yeah. Who else wants to jump in? It could be I, a question or yeah, go ahead, Dennis. I just want to say, um, what, uh, AJ just said. So, um, one of the ways that I do plan out what I preach when I preach it is I'm, <clears throat> I'm thinking about where our church is holistically and maybe a goal or direction that we're trying to get. But then I also think about our big days that we build into. Um, so most often, like I'm, uh, it, it, it kind of depends on the year, but some years I don't, I don't take a break from a series to preach on Christmas and the Christmas season. Like I just incorporate a thought into whatever I'm going through, you know, because it's all there, right? I mean, it's all about the gospel. Um, but building that into your big days. So, um, so if I'm preaching through, uh, trying to think of a series that I've done, but uh, if I'm preaching through a series in first Corinthians, well, I know that we're doing the Lord's table on this day in, you know, in the fall season. So I'm really going to plan that we're in first Corinthians chapter 12 on that week leading up to it or the weeks around it so that it's just kind of the two go hand in hand, whether that be an outreach day, you know, if you're doing a, um, you know, a, um, old school family Sunday or a friend day or something like that. Like for us, I already know in, uh, in October, October 1st is our church. It's friend day. It's, you know, just a big outreach Sunday. Well, I am preaching the passage in uh, Luke chapter eight or nine, um, where the follower of Christ is going to pick up his cross and follow me and come after. I'm preaching that message that day because it is a great outreach passage. So I kind of pick, all right, I know I want to be at Luke nine on this Sunday. Now I'm going to space things out so that in between um, uh, June, whatever the second week of June is until October you know, 1st, I know I've got to cover Luke chapter four to Luke chapter nine in those weeks. So now what does my breakdown look like and how many mess, how many messages per passage or per chapter? Um, that's kind of how I plan it is based upon my days or based upon big days that we're looking at. So, so just yeah, to follow up Dennis, on what you just said, so you're, you're looking at portions, you know, you've got, you know, Luke, I'm going to start in Luke 1, and I'm going to get through this many verses this week. Do you do this on a whiteboard where you've got all the Sundays listed, and then you're you're charting out, okay, this is this special day, this is this special day. I'm going to try and get through this number of verses then based on this many here. Is that kind of what you're saying? It's like portion? Yeah, so I keep a preaching schedule, um, and so it's a, it's a table. Um, I have uh, like one, two, three, four. I have five columns, so I have dates service, scripture text, sermon series, an idea. Um, and it's, it's a table broken up. So like right now I have it open. I'm looking at uh, this next few weeks. I know that on May 14th, I'm preaching a theme message on Mother's Day, which I don't normally do, but our theme this year is only Jesus. So I'm going to preach a theme message to our moms and our families about having Christ as the focal point. Then I know that the 21st, 28th, and 4th, I'm in 1 Corinthians 12, 13, 14. June 11th, I'll jump on Luke 4, and I'll be there until, like I said, uh, October 1st, and then I start a series in Revelation the following week. But I have ideas. I know the text. I know what big Sundays we have, and that's all broken down for me. Got it. Can I follow up question, Dennis? So so go the, the year before that you plan out the year, right? 
do you find like do you find like your schedule tends to be uh like is it kind of born out of what you're doing personally in your own bible study that leads to then this is what i'm looking forward to in the following year that kind of thing i mean or is it are you like six months out when you start planning you know for your following year that kind of thing I, I would say yes to both of those questions. I think it's born out of my own personal study, but then also um, like passages I know other guys are preaching on. I'm like, man, that's a really good series. Like I'm going to do that. Uh, so like for me, uh, next week we're starting that spiritual gift series. I just preached through first Corinthians last year. Um, I, I took, you know, I think it was 18, 20 weeks and I preached through the book of first Corinthians. But what I found is that while I was preaching through this series on First Corinthians, when I got to the spiritual gifts part, like our church, I, I mean, I had tons of people like, Pastor, I have never, I've never heard that. I've never studied it out. I don't know what my spiritual gift is. And I was tempted to like just clear off a spot and take three or four weeks and just preach that. But I didn't have peace in my, in my own heart about it. And so I put it in my preaching note and I keep a notes tab on my phone where it's like future sermon series ideas. And so then I built into this year, three weeks, just on spiritual giftedness in the church. And that's kind of was born out of what I feel like is our church's need. But then um, I'm preaching through Hosea next year. And that was born out of somebody telling me just recently, like, I've never studied out the book of Hosea. It's been really good in my own devotions. And I'm like, man, I, I preached a series on it Sunday nights like 10 years ago. I'm going to, I'll do it again on Sunday mornings and really dive into it and help people see it. So I don't know if that helps to answer that. Hey, um, I want to go to some of the guys that have been preaching even longer than Dennis. I know Dennis has been preaching about 50 years now, um, but Tim, you've been pastoring in your area for a while. Uh, Larry, you're, you're one of the more elder statesmen in the room today. I want to know a little bit about you guys um, you know, how does how does this sound when, when you hear somebody like Brian, you know, who's at least your age or younger, give some of these tips? You, you guys have been doing this a lot longer than a lot of the rest of us. I mean, what is what's your take, Larry and Tim specifically on, on some of the things that we've shared today? Well, I guess I'll go first um, since I got put on the spot. Um, you know, Many of the things he said, in some way, I have incorporated those over the years. Uh, it's not easy to do because there's so many other things going on, but uh, I have two different three-hour blocks to go through it. Now, the first three-hour block is more just collection. Uh, I might be collecting for all of the things I'm going to teach that week. And then Friday, uh, I have a, a three-hour morning block that is about final assembly because I want the 48 hours because I'll run through that first, that Friday draft two more times before I ever stand in the pulpit with it. Uh, just, that's just my plan. That's how I do it. And it seems to serve well when it comes time to deliver. I feel like I've got the concept in my heart and I'm able to deliver it. But uh, sequentially through the passage is something that has revolutionized uh, teaching and preaching every week because you kind of know where you're going. Uh, you already have the map laid out in front of you, and God's pretty good at mapping things. And so I allow him to map where the church is going to go based on how I feel, like Dennis said, our overall health of the church is, where we need to go, and what we need to preach. And so so that's kind of it uh, for, for me that I want to add in there or throw out there. That's great. Larry, I love that thought about final assembly. That is a really good concept. Tim, you want to jump in? You got anything you want to add to that? Um, yeah, I have several guys uh, sending me notes. Why I want to know why you call me old? But uh... <laughs> yeah, Dennis has got the same question. He he's told oh, me yeah. I will be eaten by she bears. He just sent that in the personal oh. thread. You, none of you yeah. saw that, but that's I what think, he said. I could show you. I think that was something to do with the bald head, not age. But anyway, you're just, yeah. you're just more seasoned than the rest of us, Tim. You you come across that way. You're a more seasoned guy. You're you're the vet. Well. Um, I guess a couple of my thoughts on it, uh, one tips, I, I was like, I kind of looked at that critically. I was like, okay, I like to look at a big picture and not, not the, the details, but, uh, and then my other critical thought was number two, some sermon, uh, consider sermon prep as the most important task. And I guess I kind of looked at that, um, 
You know, I think sometimes guys can spend 30 hours studying and no time with people and dealing with that. So I kind of was thinking, all right, how does that get applied? I, as I looked at the big picture, I thought, okay, the way probably about the last 10, maybe 15 years, I've taken my sermons instead of looking at 52 messages, I look at seasons. So I got four seasons. So uh, instead of 52 topics, I'll have about four or five topics. And then 10 or 15 years ago, I said, I really want one topic. So when I plan my calendar for the year, the way we do with our finances, my sermons and everything, I think what is a, a need that we have as a church? So this year it was on joy. I just thought going through the pandemic and stuff, I want to kind of deal with some felt needs. So everything I, I've laid out what I'm doing for the year, not just sermons, but other stuff is how can we focus on joy in the lives of people? So we kicked off the year and I asked Garrett to put a series together on Nehemiah and he went through Nehemiah, the joy of the Lord is our strength. And then, so uh, instead of 52 messages, I kind of think seasonally, and I do two seasons more outreach oriented and two more in reach on discipleship. And uh, that just helps me because uh, I can I get caught up in the details and I've got to back up and think, OK, what is the one thing I want to do this year? What are the four big pictures that I can do? And then I kind of develop my stuff from there. So I have a lot of files on themes for the year, messages that I can incorporate but I'm not a digital guy like most of y'all. I, I do it all on paper and, uh, you know, so I'm not as good to, to do it on my phone and stuff. So I have a lot of files, a lot of paperwork, and I kind of pull those things out. So that's a big picture how I put my stuff uh, together, but it's not just the preaching. It's the ministry that we do. It's me meeting with individuals and try to have one big theme for the year. Just helps me stay simple. Right on. I appreciate you sharing that too. Um, and I think for guys that don't feel like they can bite off the 52 week plan, I love that seasonal idea. That's really helpful. Um, really good. Hey, let me ask one more question here. Um, and then we'll get some final thoughts from some of you. Uh, which of those 10 things do you struggle with personally? Like you heard him say it and you see it in the notes. You're like, yeah, I know I probably could do that, but that one's a struggle for me. Are there any of those that jumped out at any of you guys? Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, I was um, not necessarily a sh struggle necessarily, but just a, a almost a question about number 10, avoiding man's influence. Because on one hand, yes, we um, we need to study, develop our own sermons, make them applicable to the local congregation that we're pastoring. At the same time, we know there's nothing new under the sun. Um there's so many resources out there that we need to draw on. And in fact, you know, number nine was be resource ready. So we need to have those essential tools. So how would you or how would everyone find that balance of making sure that you are resource ready, that you have, um, that you're drawing from all of the incredible wealth of wisdom and, and experience around us while also avoiding man's influence unless Avoiding man's influence is about extra biblical or non-biblical uh, things that people tend to preach on. Good question. I think for me, when I heard that, I think what he's meaning is make sure the message is yours. Make sure that you don't adopt the um, like the flair of, of somebody. You, you ever read through Spurgeon sermons? I mean, I, I could never preach a Spurgeon sermon, but I think that's kind of the idea that I took from what he said was don't let somebody else's personality bleed through into you know the message that you give. But I'm open to other interpretations of that. That's a great question, Adam. Anybody else want to weigh in? I would just say, uh, be sure that you that you check it out. You know, um, if you, you might read something that somebody said takes a takes a verse and and a, gives a certain meaning to it, and I would just check it out to to be sure because when you stand up there and you preach and you say this means this, uh, we, we live in a day and time when people have their phones right there in their in the pews and they're going to check you out. And if you're not lining up with what with what it says, then uh, that, that that verse means or that word means or whatever, then uh, then you're going to lose credibility. So we have to do our own research to to be sure that 
when we say the Bible says this and this is what it means, that that that's what the Greek and Hebrew and all that actually means. Yeah, my wife gets mad at me because when we sit in a sermon, I'm often fact checking people on my phone and she's like, would you just stop and listen? So <laughs> that's true, though. That's that's a legit um, concern that, you know, everybody's got a computer sitting in their laps while they listen to you preach. Yeah, I think uh, I think a part of it, too, is it's, uh, you know, you want it to be something that God's laid on your heart, you know, to 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 give to the people. I mean, that's the, the reality of it there, too. So the, the tendency is, well, I don't have to really do as much study. I don't really have to get into it as much because it's already built for me in that mindset. And so if it's not, you know, I think people see through that, too. In a lot, in a lot of cases, they see through the fact that you know, is it did God really give you this to 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 preach to us today? You know, and so uh, that's just kind of where I am on that. A lot of times, we 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 uh, we have a tendency to rely too much on on commentary and those types of things instead of allowing the Word of God to actually you know speak to us through that message. So, yeah. Hey, Ryan, I saw you were getting ready to say something, and then Tony too. Ryan, uh, let's go to you first. Yeah, I would just say, um, you know, I keep my resources pretty small if i go outside of that i do some research and make sure that the guy that i'm listening to is preaching or or reading his commentary you know lines up with so i don't have to um worry about that but uh you know i just want to say this whole this whole thing's been a blessing but i was saying about my journey as a pastor and and even my pastor i don't know if if any of you knew jeff jupp but like you can't even read his notes. I don't know how much preparation. I know he prepared, but he was. Uh, I just come from and some of my mentors or were uh, Dr. James Wilkins, and uh, he's passed on now. And Larry Clayton, and of course these guys have been preaching. I've been preaching, pastoring eighteen years, but they several times being really close to them. Even my own pastor when I was learning, it's like when are you going to teach me to preach? Like. He goes, I teach you every Sunday. He goes, just, just watch and learn. And, uh, but like with Dr. James Wilkins, one time I had it, he came in every year to do revivals and I'd be like, what are you preaching? He goes, well, I'll find out in the song service. <laughs> and these guys, so just, I would just say with preparation, the danger, I think there's both, there's two extremes being underprepared to where the Lord hasn't prepared you and, you're just you're just winging it versus preparing so much that you're preparing you prepared the holy spirit and the lord out of the whole thing together mm -hmm. where i'm at now is i'm definitely way more fluid and liquid i realize there's only 52 sundays in a in a year i'm going to preach a few series um i pray about it in a year in advance but other than that i very i'm willing sunday morning every sunday I'm willing to let the Lord change my message right there and then. It's his message. That's the way I look at it. It's his church. So I'm always like, Lord, what do you want me to feed the flock? I don't need these three points or these five or this series or this. What do you want right now? Let's go. Let's go. And yeah. so I would just say, let's make sure we're all balanced in our preparation. And, and um, you know, I write my, I write my, like Tim, I write my sermons. And I do them in pencil. <laughs> and I used to type them, and I felt like there was, I was taking too long in typing. And then I would end up writing, scratching over it. And so the ink, <clears throat> for me, the ink isn't dry. Or Sunday morning, I'm ready to ready to change stuff up as the Lord leads me. And that's where Larry Clayton and Dr. Wilkins and my pastor, they were right in there. And however, the Lord was leading so. That's my that's my encouragement to you guys. But this guys, this was a blessing uh, to me today. That's good. Hey Tony, I'm going to go to you, and then Dennis is going to wrap up. Preachers could talk about preaching all day, but I want to value your time. So Tony, then Dennis, and then I'm going to close. Hey, I was just going to add that I was taught that it's not bad to add what other people have said, commentaries and messages and podcasts and stuff like that. Just make it secondary. Start with the scripture. Let God preach to you the message they preach to others and then let that be the season that you add to it so i don't think it's bad and sometimes i have listened to other people preach on the same passage and it helps me to explain something 
better and I had it kind of cloudy in my mind. And so God works through people. God works through other resources and stuff. So I don't think it's bad. I just don't think it should be primary. That's good. Good word. All right, Elisha, and then we're done. That's you, Dennis. Sorry. You're a, you're a jerk. Uh, um, okay, real quick, I'm going to say this. My dad pastored for uh, or was in ministry for 40 years. And he would say this to me often, you can make the Bible say anything you want it to say when you use it out of context. So when we preach, right, we always wanted to flow from within context. And then I believe that a lot of pastors preach for three wrong reasons. Number one, to be applauded by other pastors, to be applauded by other pastors. Number two, to be appreciated by others like those within their church. And number three, to be accepted by their close circle. So their wife and their staff and things like that. But really our goal, right, Ephesians 4, is to be approved by God. Um, we preach to an audience of one, not, not that we're teaching God about himself, but we get up every Sunday and we declare, thus saith the Lord, because God has already spoken it into our lives. And we have already let the passage saturate in our hearts and our mind. And it is something that we're growing in and that we're being helped by. Uh, because I totally agree with what Brian said. People can tell when we throw out a rough draft. And it is something that has just challenged me. I will say one of the best things that has ever helped me in our church pastoring is just understanding how to study and how to preach and how to feed people. One resource I would give that isn't necessarily a preaching resource, it's just how to communicate effectively. Uh, everybody, you've heard of John Maxwell. There's a great book by John Maxwell called Everyone Communicates, Few Connect. And then there's a trainer with the John Maxwell group called Roddy Galbraith. Uh, Roddy Galbraith is his name. You can follow him on Instagram. He posts almost every day like three tips to connect with your audience, five things that will help you convey your truth. And just little things like that, that we as pastors can study out that help in our delivery, help in our study, help in our prep work, our illustrations, all of that. But it's for the purpose of being approved by God and equipping the saints for the work of the ministry. Awesome. Hey, that's a good one to close on. Hey guys, two quick things is we've got Sam Rayner with us next week. That's going to be a really good conversation. Be here for that. And then Josh Tice will be back. He may be back next week, but he's going to be leading a discussion on the 23rd. Uh, just giving some testimonies. We're going to have a good time with that. So really mark those two on your calendars to be at and uh, appreciate you guys showing up today. Take care. Have a good week.